This guitar is a 1965 Gibson ES-175D and it has some issues. It has the typical grind that you could expect from something so old. The pickup height is all wrong and the electronics certainly need cleaning up too. But the major problem is that the customer thought that they were doing a good thing by polishing this entire guitar with a polish that is not a good polish. In fact, it ruins the guitar. Not only the finish, but also the wood under the finish. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The short of it is, the finish on this guitar is absolutely and totally fun. So this video is, it's a cautionary tale about the effects of a certain household product on a guitar finish and the wood under the finish and also on the fretboard. This customer used a household product that I do a big reveal at the end uh, to polish his guitar and just make it shiny and stuff like that and to treat the fretboard. So if you're not interested in the process of fixing that sort of thing, repair and luthery, I do about 30, 35 minutes of, of repair work just to the frets so skip all that and just go to the end and you'll see the product but I think the the process and the the revelation and the the effects of the cause are pretty interesting to watch although probably boring if you're not into Lutheran repair uh, I hope you enjoy this video it was really fun to make and I certainly learned something about uh, you know getting the information from a customer before you tackle the instrument even though I always do that but uh, it was just a offhand sort of remark that the customer told me that he used this product and it made me kind of do a double take and I'm really glad he told me that because it, it explained all these bizarre kind of problems that I saw and, and uh, had to fix. So if you're getting value out of this video, if you learned something like I did or you're just interested in the last five minutes, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out and helps the channel grow, all that sort of thing. It, the algorithm, it, it really does help when you like and subscribe. So thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed the video. There's no more clowns. That's the only clown. Another problem which is going to be really easy to fix is this. So a high fret. Before I take the strings off, I'm just going to mark where the bridge is. If you want to look really special, really fancy, seriously get one of these Waverly tuner winders from Stumac. And instead of taking the strings off at the headstock, just take them off at the tailpiece. Put a bit of cork under it just to save the uh, finish from getting scratched. Although maybe this finish could do with a bit of scratching. So I'm going to be talking about the finish a bit later on because it's kind of a cautionary tale. It's kind of the nucleus of why I wanted to make this video. Just scanning the top of the instrument. It's a really beautiful guitar. I really like it. Everything seems to be original. The bridge was originally an all wooden, but somebody put this uh, tunematic kind of Les Paul style saddle on for better intonation, I guess. This guitar is interesting. They first came out in 1949, the ES-175, with just one P90 pickup. And in 1953, they added a second P90, and that was the ES-175D. In 1957, the humbuckers replaced the P90s, so obviously this is post-1957. It has a stamped serial number on the back of the headstock, and you can see the orange oval label in here. So that means it's somewhere between 1961 and 69, because prior to that, the serial number was ink stamped. It also has no made in the USA stamped underneath the serial number, so that also puts it in the 61 to 69 era. And thanks to the amazing website, Guitar HQ, I was able to track this guitar down to be from 1965. The Gibson serial number system is like friggin' Doctor Strange in the multiverse of madness. I'm pretty sure they take LSD and just, just generate numbers with a friggin' bingo card. And they've done that for like 120 years, so play authentically. But anyway, enough bitching by me. Although I hope it made you laugh.
Okay, so the 13th fret is buzzing. That means that the next one up is probably the high one. And I'll just keep going up just to check. It looks good, so. Yeah, so it's the 14th fret. I'll just use this fret rocker. These fret rockers are incredible. They're an essential tool, just buy one. What I'm doing now is just looking for any springiness or sponginess in the fret, just to see if it's popped out. That would be kind of the best scenario because you can just glue it back down and you don't have to dress the frets or anything. It's maybe about seven thou. It's just a high fret. It's not actually surprising because it's the body join fret and we all know that you get a little hump there. There's also a separate bit of wood under here from here to here, which is kind of joined to the actual neck wood here. You probably can't see it, but it's just another weak spot, I suppose. But it's, it's not surprising that this is a little bit high. So when you do this, don't just check the offending fret for, for springiness that it's popped up. Also check the adjacent two frets and really give all the frets the, an appraisal uh, just to see if maybe one's been pushed down or something, who knows. This fret is going to be a bit illustrative of the problem. If you can see this, it's moving up and down and I can get the uh, blade in it. This is springy on the end. And the problem that happens with this is that if you don't pick up on stuff like this, you can, you hear that fret rocking? But if I push down to where this fret should be, it doesn't rock anymore. And I can still visually see that it's spongy, it's bouncing. So it's gonna have to be glued down because the fret height itself isn't the problem. It's just that it won't seat. So when I squish it down, it's not rocking. One of the reasons that didn't help and is probably led to this is the, the fingerboard finish. And I know I'm kind of being elusive about it, but I want that to be the big reveal at the end. Like I said, it's a tale of caution. So as I mentioned before, uh, I only found out the real problem of this fingerboard when I was casually talking to the customer and he just remarked that he used a certain product to polish the guitar, and I'll get to that later. But all that has contributed to this disgusting grime. That's fairly normal to see a certain amount of this. So I, what I did, I cleaned up all of it uh, on the entire fingerboard, both sides of the frets. But after I'd done that, I realized that the frets were still spongy. And when I hammered the middle of the fret in, I still got this grime coming out of it like that. It made me realize that this fingerboard and the wood in it had a much deeper issue. So the problem is the customer used the same polish that he did on the fretboard as he did on the body. And the polish is completely incompatible with the wood or the body. And it's made me realize that I'm going to have to CA glue stabilize the entire fretboard and the frets so they don't pop out because at the moment I realize every fret is unstable and popping, which is a bad problem. So in preparation for the CA glue, I'm first coming with a kind of a medium soft wire brush that I'm just angling as much as I can under the frets. I wasn't able to get all the gunk out with a razor blade and this is proving to be quite helpful um, getting more gunk out with it. And I did hammer in each fret in the middle and that popped out the excess gunk and then I was able to come in with this wire brush. Um, I'll leave a link in the description where I got these wire brushes, they're really good. The brass leaves about 320 grit sanding marks or scratches in the fretboard. That's just something that I'm going to have to deal with later on. Easy to get out 320 grit sandpaper. The next step is to wax the fretboard. When I'm CA gluing down frets, I do two things apart from cleaning under the everything. Uh, I use a lot of wax. And the Minwax finishing paste has proven to be really good. It's good stuff. Comes in dark too. Okay, just adding a bit of wax to the fingerboard. Getting up close, I can kind of, with this charged bit of paper towel, I can kind of go on top of the fret and it, it naturally just hits either side, but it doesn't really go into the, uh, under the fret. We don't want to get this under the fret just because that's where the CA is going. I also use Starbond Thin. And Starbond comes in uh, medium and thick. The thin and medium are very helpful in Luthery. It also comes in black and amber. I haven't used the amber one, but I've got the black one as well, and I do use that, it comes in handy. Good for inlays and bits and pieces. And when you're cleaning up the CA glue, make sure you use small bits of uh, paper towel and expect to use a lot of them. Better 
to throw them on the floor before they start burning through your fingers. So using a micro tip on the CA glue bottle, just come in on both sides of the fret and put it down. You want to come in from each side towards the center with the paper towel, otherwise you run the risk of the CA glue dripping down the side and burning into the nitro. Using this is totally safe with these methods, but if you're unsure of yourself, just uh, use some glue boost, which is uh, safe around nitro. I did check these two frets before I did this just to make sure that the ends weren't spongy. So I'll go, after I do these, I'll go through the other frets and just make sure that no part of the fret needs pushing down or holding down prior to gluing. Because obviously if you wick CA glue into a fret that's spongy and, and sitting up proud or high or higher than it should be, it will, it will set there and you'll have to level it down and you'll unnecessarily lose fret height. So I let the CA sit for about five minutes and then I hit it lightly with a spritz of accelerator from Starbond. Just be really careful with this product because it contains greater than 50% acetone so you can really burn any nitro finish so be careful. So after the CA glue is set, I just come in with a sharp razor blade and come in from the edges so you don't blow out the bindings and just so then come in at a low angle, then a high angle like I am here, pushing and pulling motion, do both sides and clean them all up. Do that for every fret. And then I come back in with that wire brush and uh, just brush out any dust or anything that I can and just make sure that the CA glue is uh, seated everything right there's no actual gaps you don't want the CA glue to be gap filling you just want it to have seated the fret where it should have been in the first place so like everything else on this fingerboard the perloid parallelograms were gappy all around every edge so I just went ahead and used some fingerboard rosewood and uh, some CA glue let it dry scraping it back per usual this fingerboard or well, the frets are going to get ground and there's going to be a lot more work after this but eventually the fingerboard's going to get sanded uh, up to about 1200 and then proper oil and so it's all going to look nice after it but it's uh, still looking fairly ugly but I'm pretty happy with how this uh, fingerboard's progressing and the future is looking bright for it. Okay if you've watched this far you're definitely getting good value out of this video so please like and subscribe it really helps me out. Thank you. I was skeptical of the notched straight edge when I first saw it, but now I've used it, I highly recommend them. What I'm doing here is checking that the neck is as straight as possible, that I can get it before I grind the frets. Put a strong light behind the notched straight edge, then I use a truss rod adjuster. This one's from Stumac. Uh, I forget which size it is, but uh, I just take it up so it's relaxed and the neck is up bowing and then I just engage slowly the truss rod until the neck straightens out perfectly. The alternative is to put a, a not a notched straight edge over the frets but you're not getting the true reading of the neck because frets can be different heights of course to index off the actual fretboard. Another thing you have to be aware of is when you're measuring necks or the straightness of them just be aware of where you're putting your neck cradle because just due to gravity and leaning on you know the headstock a little bit you can upset your readings by warping the neck a little bit i'm going to be using a different wider neck cradle later on when i actually grind the frets so because this brazilian rosewood has been subjected to a bad sort of polished treatment uh, each fret is its own kind of island so i've gone over with uh, a fret rocker and marked high points on every fret and I'm going to individually grind just those points down so you can see the or hear the uh, that the middle of that fret was high but the the ends of it weren't so once I come in and do a spot grind on each of these green points of these frets then I can come back in with a light dress just over the whole thing and get it nice and then I can start moving on to the crowning and finish off with the polishing. So some of you might be wondering why I'm doing all this because the only known problem to the customer was one high fret. It's a good question but the answer is I don't sell high-end instruments because I'm lazy. If I see a problem like this I just goddamn deal with the whole thing. Um, I hate to send out an instrument 
knowing that it needs a whole bunch of work that uh, really needs it. And this did, even though the customer didn't know it. So it's now time to grind the frets and we moved to the tool chest, the magical tool chest and what can only be described as a hideous amount of expensive tools. <laughs> All, I think this drawer is everything. Yeah, everything in it is from Stuart McDonald. So I just, whatever money I make, I just send to them. Uh, so we need the fret leveler. These are great, just, just buy them. Fret levelers, the fingerboard, this is for the wood, and this is a smaller version of the fret leveler. So the older style product to uh, polish frets and do some fingerboard kind of clean up is steel wool, uh, quadruple lot steel wool. Uh, it's still really good on anything without a pickup, but when something has a pickup, I prefer to use a different product just because the magneticness of the pickup can suck in the little particles, uh, residue particles of the steel wool and kill the pickup basically. So the Stu Maxell, these Scotch Bright pads, they're like two fifty, three bucks each. The there's a general purpose maroon pad which I've also seen for sale at Home Depot and Lowe's and stuff like that, but I haven't seen the other two for sale. Um, and the ultra fine gray these are what um, Stu Mac call them and light duty white I have no idea what the corresponding um, grit is in sandpaper abrasive but I ultra fine gray is uh, the finest grit so to speak and I use that for polishing frets and um, cleaning up the fretboard and then after that I come in with uh, finer abrasives which you'll see later the next product I use all the time is this uh, low tack protective tape from also from Stumac. This is the three inch wide one and it also comes at a one inch wide one. I use both all the time. It's particularly good on vintage finishes. I often tear a bit off and then kind of rub it against my shirt to make it even less tacky. And I also wrap uh, any pickups, any cavities that are near where I'm grinding frets. On a new build, I surround the fingerboard extension just to protect the finish so the finish isn't exposed to any residue from the fret filings. The last product is the fret leveler and there's an accompanying fingerboard leveler. They come in 3 inch and 6 inch and these are really good. These two are the same grit, so to speak. Uh, they cut quite quickly, so just use a light hand on them. This shorter one is obviously for the smaller frets or for fine tuning one or two frets. I'll be using this one because I've straightened the neck and I, I can. The last thing is we want to keep this neck as level as possible when we're grinding this. So this isn't the best neck rest for this. This is actually a gun rest and you put the rifle in the rabbit ears and it makes you fire more accurately. These are five pounds, they're great. I'll leave a link in the description so you can grab one. I do recommend them. Really heavy. Um, I also use it for putting on guitar bodies when I'm routing because it stops vibration. But it's a single point and it's not going to be good enough for what I want to do. The second one is the Stumac Dead Blow Neck Rest. This is about four pounds. It's basically like a think of a bag of sand or buckshot or something. They are really good specifically for electric guitars. They do lie a bit low if you spread them out like that, but you can double them over and it raises them up and they're a very good neck rest. I should buy another one. If you have two, then you can put them kind of sideways and you can you get the split in the center and they act as in the same way that the gun rest does. So this is another neck rest from Stuart McDonald. They call it the rock and roller neck rest and there's a deluxe version of it for a bit more. I recommend all these three neck rests for different reasons, but this one's particularly excellent for this job for the following reasons. They transfer the single point to the bottom, so it rocks, but I've got two very solid points here, so that neck is not gonna be 
pushing up or down under pressure when I uh, are grinding the frets. And I should have illustrated the problem before. When I use a single point up here and I'm grinding here, this neck is gonna flex a little bit and it's probably gonna grind less on the first two frets and then more here and then kind of less here because I'm it's a hump basically. Very slight, but it's gonna be there. But when you use this, you negate that problem. Did you like and subscribe, you cheeky devil? If you didn't like and subscribe and you're still watching, that's like 20 minutes of viewing and you've learned stuff. Um, I'm gonna have to get your help to help me sort out all this spruce. I don't know how many tops are there, but that's what you get for not liking and subscribing. <laughs> so now we're gonna grind. So you can just see how I'm grinding here. I didn't go into, I didn't film too many specifics, but uh, just keep parallel with the center line of the fingerboard. Don't kind of follow the taper of the fingerboard. That's just a kind of a trick that you have to keep in mind when you're doing this. Just take very light strokes, especially with these files, and especially, especially if they're new. This, I was just lightly touching this and hitting uh, the high points. So this is the 14th fret, which is the body join, which was the main offender. You can see how much I've taken off here. Once you've hit all those uh, green high points, you can start taking down the rest of it and you can even cover the frets again with uh, some color and uh, continue on because the color is an excellent reference. Um, here I'm using a radius block just to make sure the radius is maintained in the frets. I find that when I use this I tend to be grinding a little bit more off the ends because you just out of caution you don't uh, grind the end or the sides of the fingerboards as much as the other parts just because you naturally don't want to fall off the edges of the fingerboards. The next part or the last part is before crowning. I just go over each fret and double check that everything is good um, just with the fret rocker. These fret rockers are really amazing. It took me about 10 years to buy one but I don't know how I live with that one. Obviously something else needed doing there. Just a final check and once everything is good then you can continue on with the crowning. Don't forget to like and subscribe. So to help with the recrowning what I do is come in on the top of the frets, just add some color. Red probably stands out the best. I actually do this for the fret leveling as well. It is a handy hack. Any color, any color but black. Black doesn't really show up too good. So this is my drawer with all my fretting stuff in it, a lot of my fretting stuff. I've got the Stumac Diamond uh, 300 grit crowning file and it really is amazing. It's got this nice curve which is perfect for over the body work, small areas. The centered Z file, it's an interesting file which I've used a few times and I do enjoy it. I also have the, <laughs> a knockoff, a cheap Chinese knockoff and the diamond file all fell off. It's much better to pay like the $150 for the Stumac one over the, you know, $70 for the Chinese one because not all diamond files are created equal and it really is worth your uh, the investment to get a good one. So crowning a fret is very simple. I'm going to be using the, the wide crowning side of this file. You want to leave a little bit of the top ground surface free, i.e. green on this fret. If you do that for all the frets then you're ensured that the tops of all the frets are going to be exactly equal when you start polishing them with uh, 400 grit sandpaper all the way up to 1200 grit. And hopefully you can see the green. The curve of the fingerboard is nine and a half inches and so I'm just following that curve as I file and I'm <clears throat> I'm using the curved side of this to just spot level a little bit because some of the fret leveled quicker than other parts or rather some of the fret is ground more than other parts and so you have to crown that area more than the parts that weren't ground. So you may have noticed that I don't mask off the fingerboard when I'm doing this, which others do, and you'll see why in the next section. But I just go through all the 
all the frets and take each fret up to about 1200 grit then I just rub sideways I uh, one day I'll do a separate fretting video then I just come in with a Dremel and polishing green rouge or not rouge green compound and polish each fret with a fret guard just don't go too slowly because you'll heat up the fret and you'll soften the glue underneath the next product that I use is important the way I fret and grind and polish the frets it's because my fretboard gets really dirty and you'll see exactly why and what product I use does so there's a few ways to treat the fingerboard wood uh, at any time either just for your own new instruments or for repair uh, or after a fretting job. I'll be using the Howard's Feed and Wax and I slop this on so it lifts up the fret filings and the metal dust and the wood dust from the pores and it uh, helps me that way. You'll see I'll do close-ups of that. So after a fret job I usually use this and slop it on uh, extensively and do it a few times. Works great. Easier than taping off the, the wood of the fretboard. This might be the most commonly known Dunlop 65 lemon oil. There's another one by Music Nomad, the F1 oil. They claim something that I hadn't heard, which is that lemon oil dries out the wood. I'm not sure about that. I'll presume that if they say it's true, then it is true, which isn't normally a policy that I live by, i.e. believing something that I hear on the internet, but um, I just don't think that they would. that would be something that you could really lie about and get away with. Uh, but having said that, you mean millions and millions and millions of guitars have, have had that applied to them, that's fine. Basically anything that you can find in a music store or online that is that says fingerboard oil, it's going to be good. Another thing that you don't see often but is an excellent treatment for anything, any wood that's raw, is boiled linseed oil. And it has to be boiled, 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 boiled. Other linseed oils don't dry, boiled linseed oil does dry. And I use this extensively for at Gillet Guitars for about, about 10 years and then I still use it. Basically what I use is the closest bottle that is next to me when I need it. So one of these four, I don't care which one I use, I've got no preference. So how you want to use this is you want to basically pile it on, put, put on more than you think you'll need, and then just rub it in all over the fingerboard. And the idea is to, you want it to pick up all the bits and pieces, all the particles from the frets and the wood and stuff, and you want to just pull it out and it, it will lift up all those particles as you'll see. This will give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. You can see this lifting up all the bits from the wood, the wood's getting clean. It's also conditioning the wood. It's a good product for, for doing this kind of thing. Once I've done the lifting up, the second part will be just putting it on and leaving it for about 15 minutes just to give the fingerboard a good soak, a good hydration. But the wood's pretty clean now. If I showed you the other side, so this is the first part that got done. It's actually dry, so it, it's not hydrated too well. It's more metal filings and particles than dust, to be technically accurate. That's all done. Now I'll uh, put another thinner application on the whole thing. And then I'll just leave this for about 15 minutes. If there are parts on the fingerboard where it's dry, where this is soaked in, then I'll just tap a bit of uh, a bit of this onto those drier areas just so they get hydrated as much as the wetter parts. So you can see this first fret, it's still quite wet, but then the second fret is dry. So it's wet still, but right up against the frets. That's probably got something to do with the CA glue residue. That was not surprising. I actually, it's wet up there, I actually went out for about an hour and just left this on so this is after an hour. Sometimes after 15 minutes you still you'll still get this dryness and if it looks too excessive just rub it in and do something else and come back later but uh, this is looking good as is. So after it's done its job then just rub it all out. Just use clean cloth and it'll all come out and every fingerboard I've ever done using this method it really comes clean. It might start off ugly but uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter how it starts off it only matters how it ends up uh, and you can see all the particles and bits and pieces that uh, is lifted up. This is actually clean compared to what it was. The second last thing I'll be doing is cleaning up see all this dust and stuff just all this 
getting out all this dust, cleaning up this stuff as much as I can, polishing it up as best I can. And for that, I'll be using these products. So for general grime removal, there's a few standouts, I suppose you could say. One is the Dunlop 65. That's like the lemon oil. These kind of go hand in hand. The other one is a newish one by Music Nomad. This is called the Guitar One for gloss finishes. They have a satin version and they may have a third version. I can't remember. Each brand says they're the best. I just buy them and use them and they're all the same. Uh, the last one is th this one by 3M. I don't this is kind of a new one, I don't really use it that much, but I have it and totally fine with using it. So I usually work any grime and stuff off that needs ungriming. And I'll just go around and with one wipe I might pick up quite a lot of dirt. And then with that I'll probably not use that area again and try and... It's a good idea to try and get rid of any loose dirt and bits and pieces before you get into the, the actual grime. Okay, now we come to the moment of shame. <laughs> I just wanted to zoom in and show you what happened before I show you the product that the guy used. Can you see the lines here? How they're not, uh, they're not a typical crackling effect. They have, they kind of have build up underneath them and underneath the crack, the, the wood is kind of wetted. So you can see here the, uh, these would be typical cracks. You know, just normal checking crack marks. Um, you can't see the same effect under this dark area, but once I get to the light area, you really can see, especially here, and you can see the build up if I get the, uh, the camera just right. Normally, this would be typical, just a crack and then nothing else. No, not really any problem. But when you get and use this product, you get that just there. See how that is kind of, it's a crack, but then it's orange underneath. That's where the product that he used is seeping under or through the crack and into the wood and forever, um, well, effectively staining the wood. Now it's kind of, I don't know if I'd call it ruined. I mean, technically it is ruined, but it's, it doesn't, it's not like it's, absolutely utterly horrible. It's not like somebody spray painted <laughs> something on it. But, you know, it's a shame. But the product that he used to, to wipe down the top, the back, like the whole guitar, including this headstock, and you can really see the damage that it's done to this headstock. It's just totally lifted. And it's, you won't be able to see, but it's kind of sticky. Um, yeah, so it's seeped through the cracks and stained forever, this wood. So that is a shame. It's kind of an interesting look. It sort of looks like zebra wood or something. But... So the product that this customer used to treat his entire guitar, fingerboard and body and neck and headstock was this product. Goddamn olive oil. It's really dumb. Uh, olive oil's great in cooking, but uh, it's not good around instruments. I did mention before that it is used in one aspect of instrument making, and that's French polish as a lubricant. Uh, unless you're using that, then don't use olive oil. So the difference between olive oil and say boiled linseed oil. Boiled linseed oil dries and uh, that's why it can be used on fretboards. Uh, having said that don't use any actual oil on like a, especially a cracked finish, vintage finish, because you'll get the same result with the uh, with the oil seeping through the cracks into the wood and staining the wood. Kind of like uh, CA glue does for softwoods. If, you, if it gets into the end grain, it just stains it forever. And the, the staining of this oil on there probably will forever be there. I, I can't get it out. No one can get it out without 
stripping the guitar and refinishing it, which isn't going to happen. So, this explains why, why I CA glued the entire fretboard. Um, because the olive oil just over, you know, a decade or two of him using it has seeped into the wood and kind of made it mushy. So I needed to re reharden it a little bit. And uh, now the frets are sort of not spongy anymore and it's going to be good. The finish is uh, F-U-C-K'd, but it's still fine. It's... It doesn't look totally horrible. It's not like somebody spray painted their initials on the on the instrument or something. There's there's worse things that can happen to it. Um, I sh should point out the I did mention don't use any oil on any cracked or any just any instrument other than the raw wood. Um, even if they used something like boiled linseed oil, it would have seeped into and stained the wood. So just don't use any oil on any cracked finish only on fingerboards and any oil used on any raw wood should be a drying type not this type so it's an unfortunate accident but um, you know live and learn for the guy and it still plays good and sounds good this hasn't affected any of that hasn't affected anything that matters apart from like resale value I suppose but um, you know whatevs so now is time to string it up, give it a quick play, and uh, check the frets, of course, and then call the customer. So I hope you liked the video and you learned something, what to do and what not to do. I use olive oil to all you olive oilists out there. Uh, although olive oil was Popeye's girlfriend, so, you know, not too bad. Uh, if you do enjoy videos like this, don't forget to like and subscribe. Is that jazz? Don't forget to like and subscribe and play authentically. I forgot this goes in a soft bag, so that's great. <laughs> that's that's just great. Yeah, that's gonna save it from damage. Play authentically. <laughs>